Welcome to Talk in Scripture. Grab your Bible and get ready for a great study in the Word of God. We're live. We're live. Let's go. Let's go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Talk in Scripture tonight. My name is Gary, and I'm so thankful that you're joining me here tonight as I'm coming to you live from the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountains here in East Tennessee. And I don't know what happened on the last broadcast, so we're starting all over again. It just kind of stopped on me. But uh, anyway, well, I welcome those that are in the chat room tonight. I'm thankful you're joining me here, and um, I'm thankful, and thank you for joining me here. And I want to welcome you to the broadcast tonight. We're going to talk on the subject of revival, true revival, and of course, revival is something you hear a lot of in churches and in the Christian circle. If you belong to many groups on Facebook and whatnot. And a lot of times revival is centered around a series of meetings and things in our church and made me wonder if that's what God really intended or if he wanted something a little bit deeper. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We'll be in the book of Second Chronicles chapter number seven. And many of you probably know where I'm going with that here in just a few seconds, but um my mind works in a weird kind of way sometimes, and and I started thinking about revival, and I started thinking about the way we live our life, if revival could be an everyday part of our life, which I think it can. We'll talk about it here again in a minute. And then I started thinking, well, how exactly do we use our life? How am I using my life? Is my life, am I living my life the way God intends? And way back in 1992, I know this is an old thing, but our Daily Bread had posted how somebody had calculated the typical lifespan of 70 years, how it is spent. And here is what they came up with. Sleep can account for 23 years of our life. Work can account for 16 years of our life. TV, another eight years. Eating, six years. Six years for travel, four and a half years for leisure. Four years for illness, two years just getting dressed in the morning, and probably the saddest part here is religion takes up about a half a year of our 70 years of our life. Now, I hope that, that when it comes to my relationship with Jesus, my relationship with God, that that equals a whole lot more than a half a year. I sure hope so. Anyway, we'll be back here in just a couple seconds with the Bible study. Second Chronicles chapter number 7 is where we are. Stick around. I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Talking Scripture. Kickstart your day with Scripture Link's Daily Dose of Inspiration. Live weekday mornings. Jackson's injured. Myers, grab your helmet and take Jackson's place. What? You want me to play? Well, you're on this team, aren't you? Yeah, but uh, he's a defensive tackler. Right. That's a position we need filled. Ever notice in the average church, only a handful of people keep things going? Uh, Coach, if I play, I'll scuff my helmet and have to wash my jersey. Well, why do you think you were given those things? To warm the bench? But I might get hurt. Look what they did to Jackson. God has given each believer talents and abilities to be used to build his church and glorify him. Coach, it's been a long time since I played. I don't think I'd be very good at it. Myers. You've been in training long enough. You'll do fine. Ooh, what about Roberts? Oh, he's a much better player than I am. Why don't you send him in? Roberts is on offense, and he needs a rest. Now get in there. God has something for you to do. If you're not doing it, who's covering for you? I know. Why don't I really cheer the team from the bench? Another message from Lifeline Productions. The cop- Let's get back for our Bible study. You are listening to Talking Scripture. All right, welcome back. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter number 7 is where we're going to be at tonight. And I'll, of course, be reading out of the King James Version like I always do. And um, I forgot to post on there, so if you have any, or I forgot to mention before we went to break, that if you had any prayer requests, to make sure you put them in the chat room. Um, we'll pray again at the end of the broadcast. And if you do have any, let me know um, so we could pray for those needs. 
But before we jump into our study, let's say a quick word of prayer, and then we'll get right into it. Father, I just thank you for this night that we have together and for each one of these people that you brought this way. And God, I pray that your spirit move in us, Lord, that you help us to hear your word and you help us to apply your word to our lives, Lord. And Father, I ask that you that you forgive me where I failed you, Lord, and that you speak your words through me tonight, Lord. This is your time. Use it to bring glory and honor to you, for it's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Second Chronicles chapter number seven is where we're going to be, and we're going to be talking about talking about revival. And revival is defined as an improvement in the condition or strength of something. An improvement in the condition or strength of something. I think all of us need to improve our walk with the Lord. At least I know I do, and when I make comments like that, please know and remember that I'm pointing at myself, and I'm dealing with myself more at first before I I bring that out here to our broadcast. Second Chronicles chapter seven, number fourteen, chapter number, verse number fourteen is what I believe gives us a true insight into what God expects out of out of revival, the kind of revival that God is going to honor. He says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Friends, there is no denying it that our land needs needs healing today. America is so divided in so many different ways that that many people think that it's even beyond repair. And the last few years, you've heard like I have of a coming civil war that people are are projecting and whether something like that ever happens again, I don't know. Uh, but one thing is for certain, we're not so far out of God's grasp that we can't be brought back in. And God gives us a definite blueprint here as to how we can get back on track, how we can have this true revival that America so desperately needs. And he starts off, It's this, this verse is an if slash then kind of verse. If we do these things, then God will do these things. If we don't do these things, then we know God won't do these the things that he lists, okay? So keep that in mind as we study this tonight. If my people... My people, God's children, those of us that have given our lives to Jesus, he's calling the saved Christians here. He's not calling those that don't know him. He's not calling those that have not accepted him as their Lord and Savior. He's speaking strictly to those that are in the church, strictly to those that are Christians. He's saying, if my people, which are called by my name, so he's being very specific here. Those of us that have given our life to him who are called by his name, that's who he's talking about. Look at what we have to do here if we want to see revival come not only to our life, but to our nation, to our church as well. First thing he says we need to do, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. Humbleness in our world today, many people look at that as a sign of weakness. They look at it as a sign of 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 weakness, as something that's not strong, but but yet we get our greatest strength when we humble ourselves before God. We get our greatest strength when we humble ourselves to the to the hand of God to allow God to use us. And many Christians today, many of us today are the exact opposite of humble. We go around bragging about what we have. We go around accumulating more and more stuff for ourselves and we're not going through and, and helping other people. We're not going through and meeting other people's needs. And humbleness is a quality that we must have in James chapter 4 and verse number 10 James says humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord we become so accustomed to providing for ourselves that a lot of times we leave God out we try to do what we think we need to do we try to do what we want to do 
and we don't necessarily seek out what God wants us to do. That's part of being humble. When God says here that we have to humble ourselves, that means we have to come and we have to not only confess our sins, but we have to have to 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 go unto God and say, "God, you are the one in charge. God, I am I am subjecting myself to you." You know, one thing that, and I haven't seen this in quite a while, so maybe they've quit selling them, I don't know. But one thing that used to just drive me crazy is when I would see a bumper sticker that says, Jesus or God is my co-pilot. No, Jesus or God doesn't need to be your co-pilot. He needs to be the pilot right there in our in our life. He needs to be the one that's in control. He needs to be the one that we follow. That's why we need to humble ourselves and follow him. I remember years ago, I was watching a Billy Graham crusade on TV and he said some words that I'll never forget. And I've used these words quite often when I preach or when I teach. He had said that, that we can have Jesus be our savior, but we could keep him from being our Lord. And I started thinking about that. Cause yeah, we might be okay with Jesus being our savior. We may be okay with Jesus being the one to pay the sin debt that we could never pay. But it's something entirely different when we start talking about putting Jesus in the driver's seat and allowing him to lead our lives. You know, it's like this. One of the vacations that I like to take uh, when I can is to take a cruise somewhere. Now, I know a lot of Christians don't like cruises, and there's a lot of things that goes on that, that you know, maybe we shouldn't be seeing. But one thing you really develop as a cruiser is you develop your trust in somebody. Because once you get on that ship, you don't drive, so you got to trust the captain that he knows where you're going. You don't have to worry about cooking. You don't have to worry about cleaning. You don't have to worry about anything but laying around and enjoying yourself. And as Christians, we need to put that kind of trust in God, the same kind of trust I have when I get on that ship and allow the captain of that ship to drive me thousands of miles away to a destination in another country, trusting that he knows the way to get there. Because I don't know how to get there. So you got to put that trust. And for a Christian, we got to put our trust in God so much that we're going to humble ourselves and we're going to allow him to lead us and we're going to follow him. So until we come to a point in our life where we're going to allow God to lead us, until we come to a point where we will humble ourselves, true revival is never going to come. Second thing he says here in verse number 14, we got to humble ourselves and then we have to pray. We have to pray. Prayer is something that should be a vital part of everybody's life. Prayer is something that that should be automatic in our life. Prayers doesn't have to be when you're ne- just only when you're kneeling at the side of your bed before you go to bed at night and you pray to the Lord my soul to keep in a prayer like that. I got a 35 minute drive to work every day each direction and I spend time in prayer, spend time talking with God, trying to seek his face, trying to to make sure that I am right with the Lord and I'm where I need to be with the Lord, trying to make sure that he's going to bless my work life and bless my my home life. Prayer doesn't have to be closing your eyes and bowing your head. That's what I'm trying to get at. But what I'd be curious about, like with that illustration I used at the beginning of the broadcast, how many years of our life do we spend in prayer? I would be willing to bet that it would be even less than what religion is in our life, which was that half a year. I would bet it would be less than that, and what a sad situation that we be in, what a sad situation that we find ourselves in if we're, if we're neglecting those things. I remember an illustration about this town that, that had gone for many, many months without a drop of rain, and the crops were drying up, the town's water supply was drying up, and the church decided one night that they were they were gonna that one day that that night they were gonna have a prayer meeting and they were gonna pray specifically specifically for God to provide rain for them. And that night it came and and every as the church was assembling for their prayer meeting, it was soon discovered that only one person brought an umbrella into the church. Maybe that one person was the only one that expected God to answer them that night. 
But friends, if we're going to pray, we need to be expecting an answer. We need to have the same kind of communion with God that we have with our friends, with our co-workers, with our family. You know, my dad, I'll I'll, I'll say this because I think it's kind of funny, but whenever my dad calls one of his brothers on the phone and they answer, he'll always say, Hey, so-and-so, this is Gary, your brother from Tennessee. Hopefully we never get so out of touch with God that when we pray, we have to say something like, Hey, God, it's me, Gary from Tennessee. I'm here to pray to you today. Prayer should not be something that we use as a crutch. Prayer should be our lifeline. Prayer is the direct connection to God. And prayer is 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 something we need to make sure is part of our life. If we're not humbling ourselves and if we're not praying, we're not going to get revival in our life. Let's look at the next one, number three. They shall humble ourselves and pray. And then he says, and seek my face. And seek my face. We need to seek the face of God for our lives, for our churches, for our nation. We need to seek the face of God to find out what he wants us to do, how he wants us to act. We need to seek God. And in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse number 13, we read, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Jeremiah was writing to some captives there at that time. And God said to him, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall shall search for me with all your heart. If we're not searching for God and his answers with all our heart, then we're not truly searching for God. The problem is there's too many things occupying our heart, taking up space in there that doesn't need to be there, and and that's that's causing us to stumble and fall. And that's causing us not to see God's face. That's causing us not to wait on him. We live in a world today where everything just about could be done in an instant. You know, if I decide one day when I get up that I want to watch an old episode, let's say a 1977 episode of The Price is Right when Bob Barker was still hosting, chances are pretty good that I can go on YouTube and find an exact episode I want to watch. And we can get money at the drop of a hat by going to the ATM machine. You don't even need to stand in line at McDonald's anymore. You can put in your order at a on an, on an app and have them deliver it to your car. I mean, we live in a fast-paced world. But yet God is still saying that we need to seek him with all our heart. We need to seek him. We need to search for him. We need to seek him for everything. Sometimes God gives us an answer right away when we pray to him like that, when we're seeking him. Sometimes he don't. But that doesn't mean we just go out and do what we think is right. I've done it, and it gets you in trouble. That just means we need to seek him all the more until my will and my desire lines up with his will and his desire and his plans for my life. We need to humble ourselves, we need to pray, we need to seek his face, and finally, we need to turn from their wicked ways. We need to turn from our wicked ways. Just because we go to church doesn't mean that we don't have any wicked ways in us. You never thought about it that way, did you? Each of us probably has more wicked ways in us than we ever want to admit. And God's saying we need to turn from those things. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16, and the first part of verse number 17 says, Wash you and make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. You see, we, we're in, I guess we're in tune that, that we, automatically do evil we need to learn to do good we need to learn to do the things of god we need to learn to live the life god wants us to live and if we want to have true revival in our lives and in our in our church and in our world today we need to turn from our wicked ways there's even even ways that we may not even think of as being wicked that we're probably doing 
But as God directs you, as you seek God's face, as you pray, and you say, God, remove any wickedness from me, you may be surprised at what he reveals that you need to remove from you. And you need to be strong enough and you need to be humble enough to make sure that you follow through with what God reveals to you. So if we want to have true revival in our world and in our lives, we first got to humble ourselves because before we do any of these things that we just discussed, we need to make sure we humble ourselves because it takes a humble spirit to pray. It takes a humble spirit to seek God's face to for direction. It takes a humble spirit to turn from our wicked ways. If we're not going to be humble, we're not going to pray, we're not going to seek God's face, and we're not going to turn from our wicked ways. We have to be humble first and foremost. Pray and ask God to help you be the humble person that you need to be. And then if we do these things, Scripture tells us, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If we do those things, humble ourselves, pray, seek his face, turn from our wicked ways, then God's going to hear our prayer. He's going to hear our cry for revival. Then he's going to hear that. He's going to forgive our sin, and he's going to heal our land. He's going to forgive the sins of the church. He's going to forgive our personal sins. He's going he's to cleanse us, and he's going he's to heal our land, and, and we'll see revival a new condition of our life, a new condition of our church, a new condition of our nation like we've never known before. You know, there was a lot of great things that happened in the Great Awakenings, like in, in, I think it was called Azusa Street for the Church of God, or the American, what was the Church of God, I think that was. There was great things that happened in Billy Graham Crusades. There was great things that happened in all those those places in Charles Spurgeon's ministry. You know, it makes me think of another story that I heard on, on the Billy Graham channel on Sirius XM. And I think it's fascinating because that's not a channel I normally listen to. I'm usually listening listening to Enlighten on Sirius XM. But every every once in a while when I want to get the fire for preaching, I'll turn on the Billy Graham channel and listen to Billy Graham. And and one time, I, I remember several years ago, I heard this illustration. And just recently, I turned the station on again, and they replayed that message again. And I heard this illustration again, so I think the Lord was focusing that on me. But there was this great theologian, this great... He wasn't a preacher. He was a great teacher of the Word over in England. And Billy Graham had knew this man personally, and he had told him... He had told Billy Graham one day of an encounter he had while visiting Chicago. And he was teaching at at the Moody Bible Institute there in Chicago. And he remembers getting on the bus one day and, and this lady, as the bus pulls away, this lady tapped him on the shoulder and said, uh, are you, are you saved? And the man, he didn't, he didn't say, would tell her what his name was or anything, but he says, well, yes, I'm saved. And, and the lady says, are you saved? And he said, he started thinking of a million reasons why he would be saved. And that woman was persistent. Are you saved? Are you saved? Are you saved? She kept asking him and he got on the bus and he was questioning, is he really saved? You know, we could have a, a feeling that we're saved or we can, truly give our lives to God and humble ourselves and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways and we can pray and we can truly give our life to Christ. We can truly know right now, this very minute, that without a shadow of a doubt, we're saved. Revival needs to come to America, no doubt about that. But if revival's gonna come, It needs to start with people like you and me. If we humble ourselves, if we pray, if we seek his face, if we turn from our wicked ways. It's those things you're willing to do today. Father, I thank you for this word that you've given us today. And Father, I pray that you move in our midst today, Lord, and that you convict those that need convicting today, God. 
even if someone is listening to this at a later time, Lord, convict people where they need convicting, Lord. Help us, Lord, to to help us, Lord, to to humble ourselves. Help us to pray. Help us to seek your face. Help us to try to turn from our wicked ways. Because, Lord, we need revival so desperately here in America, and we need revival so desperately in our lives, God. And let us start right here and right now. If there's someone that doesn't know you, Father, I just pray that you convict their spirit, Lord, and help them to cry out to you and confess their sins to you, God, and accept your salvation, Lord, accept your gift. Maybe there's someone tonight, Lord, that has already done that, Lord, but they back so, Lord, the cares of this world got got in and and caused caused them <coughs> caused them to, to to fall off the tracks, Lord. Father, I pray that you give them the strength and the courage to cry out to you and ask you to get them forgiven, Lord, and get them back on the right track. And, Father, for the person that is right in the middle of your will, Lord, right where you want them to be, I pray that you give them the strength to stay there, Lord, and to be that example to people, Lord, that need a good Christian example. I pray you go with each person that's that's listening right now, Lord, and that you bring us back at your next appointed time. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me here tonight on, on Talking Scripture. Don't forget, each morning, Monday through Fridays, with the exception of major holidays, you can get your day kicked off right with Scripture Link's Daily Dose of Inspiration. Um, it's just a short 5- to 10-minute broadcast. Sometimes I get a little more long-winded. Uh, but it's a short 5- to 10-minute broadcast. It covers a topic that that is relevant to your faith and is going to help you in your day-to-day walk. Um, so make sure you tune in for that and you listen to that each week or each day. It's a great way to get your day started. And then make plans to join me back here again next Sunday at 9 o'clock as we once again break the bread of life and see what message God has for us. But for right now, remember, get into God's Word and allow God's Word to get into you. And then share that Word with someone today. Have a blessed day, and remember, swing by our website if you want to listen to past episodes of, of either Talking Scripture or the Daily Dose of Inspiration, because uh, they're all on there. Swing by our website, www.scripturelinksonline.com is a place that you're going to find it. So uh, check us out online. Uh, if you do go to our website, there is a, a prayer room there. There's a prayer thing there that you can write out your prayer or praise report or prayer request and you can set it that everyone can see it or that just just me just i can see it and i would love the opportunity to pray for your needs and while you're there too just drop us a line let us know you you stop by and and uh i just hope and pray that you take these words and that you that revival starts in your life because i think if it starts in enough of us that we'll be able to do stuff to change the world. Think about that, and I'll see you next time. Have a blessed week.